I met a real estate developer. I told him about my problem and he gave me an idea that became a light bulb moment for me. And I actually found myself down at the county courthouse two days later with my surveyor meeting with the planning and zoning commissioner to try to subdivide five acres into five one acre waterfront lots. And they said, you can't do this. And I said, well, what if I did this? And I presented my light bulb moment idea. And the lady just shook her head. And she said, I don't know how you did this, but you found a way to circumvent the law. You found a way to legally do this. And nobody's ever seen this in decades that I know of. And so, yes, you can do that. Nobody could stop you. And so there was a lot of work left ahead, 13 months of difficulty, paying lawyers, paying surveyors, all kinds of things. All right, guys, welcome again to another amazing episode. Today we have Paul Moore. Um, He has been in Bigger Pockets, several other podcasts. He has his own podcast as well. Um, Let's see here. The name of it is The Perfect. No, that's his book. The book is author of The Perfect Investment, Creating Enduring Wealth from the Historic Shift to Multifamily Housing and Storing Up Profits. Uh, Capital capitalize on America's obsession with stuff by investing in self storage, uh, great books. And let's see here. He's a managing director of three commercial real estate funds at Wellings capital. Uh, he began at Port mortar company where he went on to entrepreneur for two. He won Michigan entrepreneur of two years in a row. Uh, and from there, we're just going to go ahead and dive into Paul Moore and, and you tell us, man, how you, how you began and how, how has it been going from the beginning until now? You, I mean, you've obviously accomplished a lot. You have yeah. three, three funds at Wellens Capital. So let's go into that a little bit. Yeah, I was actually finalist for Entrepreneur of the Year uh, in Michigan a couple of years in a row. And I used to want to put entrepreneur on my business card, serial entrepreneur or something <laughs> like that. And then I found out actually that it was actually... Uh, not the best idea in the world to be a serial entrepreneur. In fact, I jumped around a lot. I chased a lot of shiny objects. I lost a lot of money and I made some money along the way. And I actually, uh, that's one of the reasons I launched a podcast called How to Lose Money. And we have about 238 episodes. And um, nice. we talk to people about their struggles, their pain, their losses and frustrations along the road to the top. And we're hoping that we can help people not replicate their mistakes. So um, like you said, I sold my company to a publicly traded firm in 97 in Detroit. I moved to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia with my family. We started a nonprofit organization. Then my buddy and I started flipping houses. Then we started flipping waterfront lots at a resort in Virginia. We uh, also, I I did a small subdivision. I started doing modular and ground up construction homes. And I did one commercial real estate investment that went pretty well. And I was trying to figure out how to get into commercial real estate. But, you know, at the time, syndication wasn't real famous. And it was hard to know how to get in, who to trust, where to turn, and But in 2010, my buddy and I started investing in oil and gas in North Dakota, and we found out that there were thousands of oil workers there, but there were not thousands of places to stay. And so we began, uh, we started a multifamily uh, project that we were able, there was no zoning there. It was kind of the wild west. And we were able to complete this very nice multifamily project in about a year. And uh, we housed oil workers. We made a lot of money. It was a lot of fun. We jumped from there into a Hyatt hotel, ground up construction. My my business partner did that and it did not go well. And it made me really want to stay back in multifamily. And so I ended up back in multifamily, ended up writing the book called The Perfect Investment. And that's when we started our multifamily syndication firm back in 2014 or so. That's awesome. I have to hit on something because I actually lived in North Dakota. Did you? Um, yeah, I was stationed there from Minot. 2013. And Minot, yeah. Minot. 2013 yeah. To- Why not Minot? That's where we did our hotel in 2013. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that, I was just about to ask you because 
I was there when I arrived, huge boom. I mean, oil, gas, big there. And then the rest of the world did not know what was happening there, but it was huge. And then apartments and houses going up everywhere. Yeah, right. When I left, it crashed. When did Uh, you leave? In 2016. Oh, yeah, it Uh, sure did. It crashed about 2015, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, 2016 was horrible. I mean, you had an apartment buildings vacant, boarded up. Right. Homes they couldn't sell. So just curious, were you out of there during that time already or? So we had sold our multifamily, uh, our apartments in uh, 2013 or so. I think it was six months before the crash. Um, the Unfortunately, the hotel was 50, no, 30% over budget on cost, at least 30% over budget. It was twice as large as it should have been. And it hit the, you know, oil price drop from a hundred dollars a barrel down to let's say thirties. And so all that combined just made for a real difficult project for my business partner. And he eventually got out of that and moved on, but uh, that was not profitable at all. Gotcha. But I, I imagine a huge lesson learned there of, of how to navigate that even better for future down, down cycles, right? He made over $10 million on a couple other deals since then, since 2016. So he's doing okay. All right. That's awesome. That's good to hear. No, and I'm sure that's what I mean. It's all about moving on, taking those lessons learned and applying them to future right. deals. Right. Yeah. So that's what I, I wanted to get out of that. Day. Even though there's, there's failure involved, not to be afraid of failing and to applying those failures. In the right. Future, right. German, you got anything? Yeah. So when you, um, when you, when you lost all that money, uh, were you not aware of what's coming up or what happened that made you stay into that project and not pull out, uh, based on the previous experiences that you had before? Yeah. In the Hyatt hotel. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully for me, I didn't lose any money. He, he was all in this guy, you know, he's a real go getter. He ran for governor of Colorado after that. I mean, the guy is super smart and ambitious and he wanted this to be his retirement. So he raised all the capital for that project. He had all the debt and uh, he is the guy who took the big hit. Unfortunately. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Got it. That's awesome. Okay, so moving moving forward with that, um, you know, you've been obviously you got other deals and going now into, you know, what you have at Willing, Willings Capital. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you went ahead and structured that and started your your company? Yeah. So we, after writing the book, I promised my wife I wasn't going to chase any more shiny objects. We had a wireless internet company in North Dakota as well that never went well. And I told my wife we weren't going to do anything else. I was just going to focus on apartments. And over the years from 2014 to 20, well, 2014 to 18, really, uh, multifamily had gotten so out of control in my mind, so overpriced. And the combination of that with the fact that we didn't have a full-time deal finder on our team, we didn't have anybody to find great off-market deals made us very hesitant to stay in multifamily. And so we decided to expand from multifamily into self-storage and mobile home parks. And when we did that, we decided it would be very difficult for us to become an operator, to learn the ropes, and to become as good in those areas as you know we believed we were in multifamily. And so we decided to partner with other operators. We decided our best path would be to find the very best in class operators out there and invest heavily with them. And by doing that, we were able to get a much better by being a much larger than average investor with these guys, we were able to get a better deal structured, which we pass along to our investors. And we were able to um, have you know, really, really take our time to do due diligence on an operator. It's sort of like when Warren Buffett buys a company, you know, he does a ton of research on the company and then he doesn't have to worry if they, let's say they bought, he bought Dairy Queen. Well, when Dairy Queen Queen rolls out an individual ice cream flavor, 
he's already got confidence in the management team that they did their homework. He doesn't have to get down in the details and worry about that ice cream flavor. In the same way, we don't have to get into the details of every mobile home park purchase or every self-storage purchase because we're really focused on finding the very best operators. And that has worked out really well. So far, we've got it structured as a fund. We're actually on our third fund and we allow people to invest once with us and we spread out the money across, like in this case, this year, um, <clears throat> 76 different mobile home parks and self-storage facilities. Wow, that's pretty that's pretty sweet. So let me ask you this, because it sounds like, I mean, as a fund, you diversify. What is the best asset class or what is your favorite one at least that you that you like? Yeah, um, I think right now, if I had to choose one, uh, even though I just I'm writing a book, as you mentioned, on self storage, uh, my favorite asset class at the moment is mobile home parks. It's the only asset type <clears throat> that has a diminishing supply and an increasing demand every year. There are 90% or so of the mobile home parks in the US, we believe there are about 44,000. 90% are run by mom and pop operators. They're highly fragmented. These operators don't have the desire the knowledge or the resources to upgrade their part to make it run at maximum efficiency and therefore to make it, you know, to maximize its value. We can give them a very fair price, make them very happy when they leave, but we can still have tremendous upside when we go in with a professional operating partner to upgrade it. And so that's, that's my favorite asset type right now. Oh, that is awesome. That's good to hear. Let me ask you about about mobile home parks, because there are obviously different types of mobile home parks. Um, do you are there certain like do you want just the ones with the pads and you uh, you rent out the pad or is it all mobile home parks? I like, know there's different ones, right? Yeah. So a lot of the uh, mom and pop operators own a handful or even many of the mobile homes, and <clears throat> Freddie Mac. And Fannie Mae really don't like that. Their underwriters like a very small percentage or even ideally none of the homes to be owned by the park. And so we sort of, our operators track with what they like because they're real smart. They know a lot of statistics across a whole lot of assets, you know. So our operators track with that and do their best to try to offload those park-owned homes into the hands of the individual uh, tenants. Got you. Okay. No, that makes total sense. So, moving here, um, you know, one of the questions that you have in your in your bio is, what secrets uh, are used by the super wealthy to attain and maintain their generational wealth? One secret is you're just the whole set of uh, real estate tax breaks. I mean, when President Trump and Congress in 2017 changed the tax law, I mean, it favors real estate investors ridiculously. If the American public knew <clears throat> how little tax the average commercial real estate investor pays, there'd probably be another tax revolt against us. And um, so some of those secrets are the fact that, you know, you, you can do a 1031 exchange. You can't do that with a boat, a car, an airplane, art anymore, but you can with real estate. Well, you continue to do <clears throat> 1031 exchanges one after the other. You can do something called swap till you drop. And I know somebody who recently inherited, they're the third generation investor who's inherited a 1031 exchange from their parents. And these properties have never been out of the families for all those years. I think it was since the 70s. And, um, you know, when they inherit it, I believe the depreciation clock starts over, though I can't guarantee that. But uh, in addition to that, there's no capital gains tax. It's the, the basis is reset. Yeah. to the current value. And that's a huge benefit to generate multi-generational wealth. But there's a lot of other real estate laws that are really incredibly in our favor. Yeah. And to explain to explain the, uh, the what they're 
where they're gating uh, as a as a, as they inherit these these properties, you know, from from their families. Uh, they're inheriting also the uh, the cash flow that comes right. with that every month. So right. when people so people can picture what it means. It's not just the properties, but it's it's, it's all the money that they're producing monthly, right. and they don't have to pay taxes on that. So right, that's 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 pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah it is. No, that's, that's amazing. True. The bonus depreciation laws are just, I, I still, am, I'm pinching myself. I can't believe how strong they are. I mean, I'm getting ready to uh, flip a mobile home park that I just was part of the acquisition on. And uh, the looks like, you know, any day now that's going to sell and the short-term capital gains on that are going to be quite substantial. But I believe that I should be able to wipe out all those by investing in another commercial real estate project um, and getting the bonus depreciation that basically takes 15 years of depreciation potentially and compresses it all into one year. And that first year write off that first year paper loss is enormous. And yeah. so the chance to do that and then do it over and over again is quite remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. And then as a real estate professional, I mean, the amount of write-offs that you can do are just ridiculous too. Oh, I know. It's amazing. Yeah. It truly is. is. Now, and, and just to just to add to that, when you're doing, for example, syndication or when you're raising money, all those get transferred also to the investors. So you as a passive investor get a, a piece of that cake as well. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. the, the, the K1, the structure of a real estate syndication allows all the losses to flow through on form IRS form K1, which means the investors have a real piece of ownership in the property, <clears throat> not just a share of stock in the company. Nice. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's, that's a secret that the wealthy use to build more yeah. wealth. <laughs> there yeah, you go. those are wonderful things. Yeah. yeah. There was a big outrage when the president's tax returns were seen. Yeah. Or at least uh, there was a few pages of them apparently found by the New York Times or something back in October. And the truth is um, almost all the real estate investors shrugged their shoulders and said, well, of course he pays no taxes. He's a real estate investor. And so love him or hate him, his tax returns just reflected the reality of the benefits that we get. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's what we, we try to tell so many people is exactly what you said, love or hate him, his he, he's in a bracket as a real estate investor that, I mean, he's got hotels and things in New York City. I can imagine the millions of dollars in bonuses depreciation. I mean, yeah. he's probably depreciating for years, like <laughs> that amount of money that right. there is in that. So right, it'll be a long time before he, he has to pay anything, to be honest. Right. Yeah. So moving on here, you have, um, you say, you know, how you your losses right so one of your big losses that you have here and it's i imagine it's a pretty cool story you went for 1.5 million in the bank 2.5 million in debt and then back debt free in 13 months yeah uh, and you did it apparently by giving away your your debt so can you can you elaborate <laughs> oh, look, sounds like an amazing story there how could that be possible well it's not exactly what happened. So I, I had about a million and a half in the bank after selling our companies in 2007. Exactly 10 years to the month later, I had two and a half million in debt and it was all against real estate properties. But I didn't know we were facing the Great Recession. Of course, I couldn't tell the future. And so if you can imagine where we were in the fall of 2007, not knowing what was coming in 2008, we knew that there was the economy was not great, but we didn't think it would be that bad. Yeah. And so I, uh, my business partner about that time handed me the deeds to all the properties and the debt. And he said, look, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I can't uh, be on the hook for half these debt payments and I can't be on the hook for this. So he quit December of 2007. And so I was actually doing my meditation practice one day and I was thinking about what would George Mueller do? Now, George Mueller was this great, uh, this hellion in Germany in the early 1800s and he became a saint in England. 
and he lived there through most of the 1800s, and he actually housed 10,000 orphans, and he did it all by just faith and by just believing, you know, that God would take care of him. And he didn't actually ask for any money ever. He never did any marketing ever. And he raised what we believe was quarter billion to maybe almost half a billion dollars in U.S. dollars in today's money. And he didn't believe in debt. So if I wanted to be like him, that wasn't going to happen. But he also did, he did believe in doing outrageous things that were countercultural. And so I thought, what would George Mueller do? I think George Mueller would start giving away money. He would start giving away money and trust that he would be taken care of. And so I told my family, I said, hey, we're going to give our way out of debt. And I told my friends who said, maybe you should declare bankruptcy. I said, no, we're going to give our way out of debt. And that made no sense to anybody. But we started giving to some nonprofits and some things we really cared about in January 1st, 2008. We gave a set amount every week. And within four weeks, I met about four weeks later, I should say, I met a real estate developer. I told him about my problem. And he gave me an idea that became a light bulb moment for me. And I actually found myself down at the county courthouse two days later with my surveyor meeting with the planning and zoning commissioner to try to subdivide five acres into five one acre waterfront lots. And they said, you can't do this. And I said, well, what if I did this? And I presented my light bulb moment idea. And the lady just shook her head. She said, I don't know how you did this, but you found a way to circumvent the law. You found a way to legally do this. And nobody's ever seen this in decades that I know of. And so, yes, you can do that. Nobody could stop you. And so there was a lot of work left ahead, 13 months of difficulty, yeah. paying lawyers, paying surveyors, all kinds of things. But 13 months later, I was completely debt free and I even paid off my house right in the middle of the great recession. Wow. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit about that, that I get that, 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 idea, that idea. Yeah. Well, that idea, but I also don't like using the word loophole because I think if the rule, yeah, the it rule was. it's not a loophole, but it's it like, was, it was a loophole in this case, but was it? probably, um, but it was totally legal and it just, is actually quite detailed. And I would guess most of your audience won't be able to follow this, probably because you'd have to see it laid out on paper to really do it, but I'll do my best. Okay. There's a clause in a lot of rural counties in Virginia and other places around America that's, that allow you to split off land that you couldn't usually split off and give it by a gift to a relative. Now, everybody in this area knows that or most people do, and they know you can give away land to a, a relative. The problem is they have to hold it for five years. And so that wouldn't work because I needed to make five splits at once. You know, I needed to make it in five, eight, five acre parcel into five, you know, five one acre parcels. And even if I gave one parcel to each one of my kids and my wife, I had four kids and a wife, I thought of this, they'd have to hold them for five years. But the idea, the light bulb was, what if I could get one investor, one person who really wanted the prime lot, the best lot to buy all five and then gift one acre to his wife? Well, they were going to build a house on it. So they didn't care about keeping it for five years. They were fine with that. So that's what he did. He paid like 1.4 million or something for the whole thing, all five yeah. acres. And then he gifted one acre to his wife. But here's the loophole. The law did not say he had to keep his main parcel for five years. The law didn't say how long he had to keep, keep it. And nobody thought of this. It's just the one that you gift. Yeah, so the one he gifted had to be held five years by his wife, and then he could sell the other four acres immediately. Why don't you? Yeah. So I convinced him to pay five times as much as he wanted for his one acre, buy all five acres, then he gifted one week later 
four acres to the neighbor. And he actually took a loan on this. Some bank in 2008, of all things, was willing to loan him five times as much as he wanted for this one lot to buy the whole thing. That's about double what the five acres was worth as a whole because it was only worth like 800,000. Yeah. He borrowed like 1.4 million or something. And then he gifted one of uh, four acres to the next guy. He gave an acre to his wife and then he sold three acres. He gifted an acre to his wife and he sold two acres. And the last guy gifted an acre and kept an acre. And so, I mean, kept an acre and sold an acre. And so I sold four of those five lots in the fall of 2008 using this crazy idea. And um, nobody was even buying lots in the fall of 2008. No banks were hardly ever loaning money to build houses and it all worked. And I think it's because, you know, I had that crazy faith to believe that I could give my way out of debt. And it's, it's incredible that those ideas come out when you're at the bottom or in the darkest moments of your yeah. life. You find those crazy solutions that otherwise you wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, that's uh, right. That, that's amazing. That's, I, I got I to gotta listen to this episode again just to wrap it around my head. <laughs> that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Oscar. No, that's yeah. Cool. No, I think I yeah. think it's amazing how, how you were able to do that. That's, that's a true story. And it's, it's amazing to see that. By giving away, you were able to get out of it. Yeah, isn't that yeah. crazy? It's, yeah. It's still and amazing I, to me, and my kids will never forget it. And I like the how, how you were, you know, you're up against the wall, and you had to find a way, you know, digging through documents. I imagine, I mean, I don't know if it was you or, or with other people, but you were looking at county county code, county records to see, hey, how can we do this? You know, is, that, we- is that what you were doing? Or, or you just came out with the idea and you went to, to the, uh, you went to the courthouse and you basically brought up the idea and, and started doing the research as that idea came out. Now, the real estate investor, uh, excuse me, developer that I met at Subway Restaurant on that day, he just gave me the idea. He okay. said, have you thought about the family exemption law? And I said, yeah, I know about that. That won't work because you got to hold it five years. He goes, well, I don't know. Um, he said, maybe nobody told you you had to hold both tracks for five years. And that was the moment I had the idea. That's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. And it, and it's, and that goes for everything. You know, we sometimes interpret things the way we want to interpret it or the way that everyone's interpreting, but sometimes we're not reading it to the full extent of what it's saying. Right. It's saying yeah. <laughs> black and white, you should not do this. Okay. But it doesn't say I can't do this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the lady thought it was quite funny when I went to her at the courthouse. And uh, she said, nobody's ever thought of this, but she thought it was sort of funny. Yeah, yeah that's pretty yeah. cool. Did they change that after? No, no, Not my they- friend, 12 years later, so this year, a friend of mine who, who has about 20 acres near there, he called me and he grilled me and he asked me how I did it. And then he went to the courthouse and asked them also. And oh, wow. uh, he, he said they said he could do it. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty cool. cool. That's pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. Cool, Paul. Well, thank you so much, man. Thank you for, for having coming on and, and, and taking the time. If you could tell our audience how, how can they get a hold of you? How can they reach you? And, yeah. and where can they get your book as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my book, The Perfect Investment, which is about multifamily investing, is available on Amazon. And it's also available on my website, wellingscapital.com. My new book called Storing Up Profits is not out yet. It's going to be coming out from Bigger Pockets Publishing, and we expect it to be out in the spring. And then um, they can reach me at my website, wellingscapital.com. That's W E L L I N G S C A P I T A L, wellingscapital.com. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And all the listeners out there, give us a five-star review. Uh, shoot us a, a message, a comment. We're always glad to help and respond. And again, Paul, thank you so much for coming on and, and we're out. <laughs>